Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guests today are my good friends, Elena Olke and Scott Ritter. And, and both Scott and Elena are going to talk about the situation in Ukraine, what the, the, how the people in Ukraine are suffering. But we don't hear too much about that on the mainstream media. So I want to give you, uh, Elena, um, the first crack at this. Uh, from your perspective, what's going on and what don't we hear? First of all, thank you very much, Cynthia, for bringing this up, uh, because most of the uh, uh, Western media and media at large does not really cover the stories that are uh, coming from Ukraine that I hear in the native language, since I do speak Ukrainian uh, and Russian as well. Uh, the situation is dire. The uh, population is obviously, we know, suffering. There is about 5 million refugees that uh, people that actually ran to Russia uh, during the uh, special military operation, uh, which already uh, basically uh, has been going on for a year. But there is about um, equal amount that uh, ran to various countries uh, of Europe. Uh, so the families are basically divided. Uh, uh, the children and the mothers may be in Europe. The husbands are in the trenches. Um, there are in, in the war zone on the front lines. Uh, however, Zelensky regime has been uh, criticized heavily by Ukrainian population uh, lately for the policies that they um, started to enact, what they do uh, against the uh, Orthodox Church in there in Ukraine. Uh, the mothers uh, are begging the soldiers and uh, the police to not close the churches which uh, Zelensky believes that the churches are the problem and, and they are uh, propaganda tools for Kremlin, whatnot. It's insanity. Um, I watch a lot of different videos. The soldiers from the front lines, uh, they call volunteers of Ukraine, the ones who they believe are honest, not the ones that the Ukrainians see on the uh, main TV channels, but the ones who are honest are basically saying that the soldiers on the front lines do not have weapons. The commanders build, not all of them, but a lot of them build corrupt empires um, out of the military aid and uh, the humanitarian aid is uh, getting stolen by uh, train loads. Um, the volunteers who help the civilian population as well as some of the military population to bring these problems uh, to the front lines uh, they get attacked, they get put in jail, they get put under house arrest, so you obviously cannot bring any issues. Uh, it's like a death sentence or it's like a jail sentence. So it's a variety of uh, different problems. There is a lot of uh, um, concern uh, between civilian populations about people who are missing in action. The so wives are looking for their husbands, they're looking for their sons. The officials are not uh, open about what happened and uh, the volunteer that I watch a lot of his videos, he gets the phone calls from the front lines where the soldiers say that commanders are withholding the payments from the soldiers at the front line. But if the soldiers speak about it, they get put in jail or they get uh, labeled as deserters or uh, the soldiers who are in fact killed in combat, they uh, labeled as if they're missing in action. So then the payments do not go to widows according to those people who I watch. And uh, you can find those videos all over YouTube and TikTok and whatnot. So there's lots of problems in Ukraine, a lot of problems with the civilian population from living conditions to the fact that the Zelensky regime does not answer Would they have hotlines for the population with the questions and the concerns. Uh, the soldiers tried to have a meeting with Zelensky from what I understand, what I watched. And he closed the doors and they were told that, no, it's a martial law we have in Ukraine. So nobody can see Zelensky. And the soldiers say, so why is Zelensky meeting with Sean Penn and all the Hollywood actors, but he cannot meet with us and address mm -hmm. our concerns. So the government, basically Zelensky regime insulated themselves from the problems uh, of the people, from civilian population, um, the humanitarian aid, that West provides gets sold in the supermarkets. Nobody's doing much about it. 
the um, military and the weapons are not making it to the front lines. A lot of times soldiers record the video saying they do not wish to go to the front line because they feel that like they've been used as a cannon fodder or what they call battlefield meat. Um, yeah, lots of different problems. Unfortunately, Western media doesn't cover it. And thank you, Cynthia, for trying to enlighten us all about it and making this a topic of your show. Thank you. But when when we hear about horrific conditions in the Ukraine, uh, what, what the Western news media focuses on, it's all Putin's fault. Absolutely. And, and, that's, a, and that's one of the uh, concerns that I have since I understand what is going on in Ukraine. I've understood it for years. I obviously am from there originally. Um, that the propaganda machine of uh, current Ukrainian media, as well as our media, uh, portrays Putin as an ultimate evil. Everything is Putin's fault. They don't want to look at Biden's dealings in Ukraine. They don't want to look at Hunter Biden's story and all the companies that he was a part of in Ukraine and all the corruption that is going on in Ukraine. They just, not all, but a, a part of Ukrainian population has been living under this heavy propaganda that everything in the world is Putin's fault. So they are not particularly keen on seeing their own corrupt politicians and, and how they are connected to the Western corrupt politicians. But a lot of soldiers on the front lines are waking up. I see a lot of videos and they're saying, what are we fighting for? What are we fighting? Yes, yeah, they tell us we fight for independence, but why did our parliament members remove our combat pay increase? Why did the parliament members send all their children abroad and their children are in Belgium, in the United, in United States, in the uh, United Kingdom? And why are they and their children are not on this front lines and we are. And how come that Ukrainian parliament again removed the extra pay from the frontline soldiers, but gave themselves an, an increase? On top of it, they gave themselves an increase for psychological trauma caused by Putin aggression, psychological trauma, parliament member, while the soldier in the trenches sitting there in this freezing cold and in and, 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 uh, freezing off their limbs, they took extra payments away from them. It's insanity, but soldiers and a lot of Ukrainian population tries to wake up, but I think the mostly it's the soldiers and their families who see the corruption that is occurring. And, um, but the people who are like some of the Ukrainian personalities sitting on TikToks or sitting on YouTubes with millions of followers saying, oh yeah, everything is put in hold. It's Russia, Russia is the aggressor. You dig deeper, their children are not the ones fighting. And they are the ones who encourage Ukrainians. So we're gonna win, we're gonna win. Give us more weapons, give us more weapons. But their children are not on the front lines. And they're even not, most of them in Ukraine. Most of them abroad. So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult, uh, difficult part between reality, which we know, uh, what Zelensky is doing to his own people versus propaganda that conditions people to think that everything is Putin's fault. You're correct, Cynthia. Scott? I think we also should focus on um, the other side of the, the border as well, um, meaning that uh, you know the, the, the population of uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk, uh, all these used to be Ukrainian uh, territories uh, and the people there used to be Ukrainian citizens. Um, in 2014, after the coup, uh, and, and a lot of people don't realize what what happened after the coup, the uh, the rise of the Nazis, Azov, um, and and what they did to places like Mariupol, um, what they did in Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, the rape, the torture, the pillage of the Ukrainian army coming in and violently suppressing uh, those. Uh, ethnic Russian Ukrainians who said, we don't support this coup d'etat. We support the constitutionally elected government of Viktor Yanukovych, whom we voted for. 
who's been removed by an American-backed coup. Um, and, you know, they, they stood up and, and resisted. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's an infamous speech given by um, uh, Petr Poroshenko, who was the president of Ukraine in 2014, where he uh, rails, rails on TV saying, Ukrainian children will go to school and they will walk peacefully in the park. The children of the Donbass will cower in their basements as we shell them every day. That is their future. Um, and the reason why he could say that is that the Ukrainian government stopped viewing these uh, these civilians as uh, civilians and viewed them instead as terrorists. A lot of Americans don't understand that in April 2014, the Ukrainian government passed legislation uh, creating an anti-terrorist operation and the entire population of the Donbass were viewed as terrorists. And this is why they're shelled mercilessly every day. And they've been shelled every single day from 2014 until today. And the Ukrainian government doesn't view it as shelling civilians. They view it as killing terrorists. So every civilian that lives in the Donbass, every civilian that lives in Zaporizhia, Kherson, is viewed as a terrorist. And this has to be reflected on, because that's one of the reasons why the Russians intervened, to protect the ethnic Russian people of this region who were being viewed and treated by their government as terrorists. Um, you know, uh, Elena, I thank you for, for, for speaking, you know, but there's another voice out there too, uh, a lady named uh, Masha Le Leonova. I might be getting that name wrong. She, uh, when this special military operation started, she lived in Moscow and she was one of what I guess we would call the liberal elite who opposed this conflict. She was just viscerally against the notion of war, and she protested in the streets and indeed was arrested and beat up by Russian police. Um, she, she ran away from Moscow, sought refuge in the Far East, but came back and decided uh, she was hired as a translator by an American uh, journalist, and she went to the Donbass to see, translate. Yeah, I've seen her know. interview. Pardon? I've seen her interview, yes, with yeah. Ma John McDougan, yes. Yeah, with Mc McDougan. And uh, she uh, she started talking to people, and she at first thought that they would hate her because she's Russian, of course, and Russian troops are there. And uh, and she had bought into the entire Western media about Putin did this, Putin did that. Instead, she was thanked. I mean, they they literally embraced her and, uh, and thanked her and said, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for helping us. And she said, thank you for what? This place is a hellhole. You're being bombed. They said, yes, we need to be freed from this. You guys are saving us from this fate. This has been going on for eight years. For eight years of the attack. What you're looking at is not Putin. It's Poroshenko. It's Zelensky. It's the Ukrainian government slaughtering the people of the Donbass uh, who dare oppose uh, what they are doing. And uh, she sub subsequently went back eight times to provide humanitarian aid uh, to this. And she said, it's it's horrible. And now reflect on this. The people of the Donbass are treated by the Ukrainian government as terrorists. And they treat the Russians as liberators. Now, put yourself in the shoes of, uh, of, of, of the Russian forces. You come in to liberate the Donbass, you initiate the special military operation, and now you're engaged in a life and death struggle against Ukrainian Nazis. This is what the Ukrainian are. I, I, I know, Elena, you speak of the poor Ukrainian soldier in the field and all that stuff. At some point in time, I don't care about the poor Ukrainian soldier anymore. They all need to either surrender or die or turn their guns on the Zelensky government because as they stay in the trench, they're simply fighting for a cause that doesn't deserve to be defended anymore. If you don't know what you're dealing with right now, then mm -hmm. you're probably never going to learn. Um, but as a result of this conflict, tens of thousands of children were abandoned, were left abandoned in the war zone. Tens of thousands of children were left abandoned. Many of them were orphans, uh, and the Russians had taken control of the orphanages. Many were children who were left by families who fled and left them behind. What did the Russians do? They removed the children from the war zone, and they took them back to places of safety. Uh, this we're, we're talking about in the spring, and in the summer, in the summertime, there's many camps in the Moscow area, St. Petersburg area, which um, are former pioneer camps. These are uh, camps that the Russian children will go to in the summertime, etc. They cleared these camps of Russian children and they turned the camps over to the exclusive use of these Ukrainian children and they cared for them. They provided them with food, clothing, housing, entertainment, everything. Um, and, uh, and then 
I mean, Putin, of course, has been now charged with a as a war criminal for for overseeing this. They accuse him of kidnapping the Ukrainian children. What kidnapper takes the children, takes care of the children, and then works to return the children to their families? Ukrainian families have gone to Russia and taken their children back, and the children are left. But now, when the children come back to Moscow or to Ukraine, what happens? Ukrainian government threatens their family with arrest, accusing the family of cooperating with the Russian government by allowing their children to be taken into safe haven. So now under the threat of arrest, which means for the man going to the front line and dying, for the woman losing your job, the children now have to tell stories about how they were tortured, beaten. They were never tortured. They were never beaten. This is what the Ukrainian government does. It tells lies about literally everything. And at, you say, well, Scott, what's the evidence of this? I don't know. Go ask the teachers who worked in the uh, Kharkov region after the Russians came in. You know, those teachers had to teach students. And so in order to teach students, uh, many of them went to Russia to learn the Russian curriculum. And so because now they were under Russian administration. Now they came back. And when the Ukrainians counterattacked, all of these teachers were arrested. Many of them were executed on the spot for collaborating with the Russians. In fact, anybody who collaborated with the Russians, any who lived their life under Russian occupation has been executed, brutally tortured by the Ukrainians. You have Ukrainian uh, Nazi thugs bragging about how a new census will have to be taken because they have killed so many people. They don't know how many people they've killed anymore. They just shoot them, they roll them down the hill, their bodies are rotting in the gutter. The Russians came in, found these bodies, buried them, and now the bodies are exhumed as mass graves, accusing the Russians of killing them. The Ukrainians are murderous thugs who have subjected the population of the Donbas, Kherson, and Zaporizhia to the most brutal repressions. You ask anybody who operates under Russian control, I mean, now, yeah, don't ask the people who serve as spotters. I know we've all seen the videos of Ukrainian men being led away to be shot. You know why they were shot? Because they sat in their house in civilian clothes on a cell phone reporting Russian military positions using the telegram channel to Ukrainian artillery who spotted them. That is a war crime. They were caught. They were treated the way you treat war criminals. But the average Ukrainian citizen is treated properly. They're fed. You know, the Ukrainian government has cut off gas to uh, certain regions. The Russians are providing gas. The Russians are providing pensions to all for, uh, former citizens. The Russians are providing uh, uh, you know, medical care. All the social services that exist for Russia are being provided. And yet we read in the rest about the brutal Russian oppression of the Ukrainian people. It's absurd in the extreme. The Russians are doing everything right. The Ukrainians are doing everything wrong. But the media won't tell the truth. Let me ask you this question, Elena. Scott and I have talked a number of times about uh, the Nazi re regime uh, going back to 2014 and how, you know, uh, the Jewish community in this country has been silent about the uh, treatment that's going on in the Ukraine. How do the Jewish people feel in the Ukraine about Zelensky, uh, that, look, Zelensky, who's a Nazi, and all of the other Nazis in power? Uh, first of all, I wanted to respond to Scott. For some reason, Scott thinks that I have this uh, position of trying to uh, shield or protect the poor Ukrainian soldiers. That's not what I was trying to say, Scott, not at all. Cynthia asked me to report on what I hear from Ukrainian media. That's all I was saying. No, no, I wasn't accusing. Yeah, first so of all, don't, Elena, don't, I, I, no, I respect. Yeah. First of all, I respect your humanity, and uh, and 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 I'm not accusing you of anything. If anything, I'm trying to explain my position because I think a lot of people will find my position very, very harsh, very harsh. That I'm unfairly um, that I, I treat the average Ukrainian soldier unfairly, and I probably do. But at this point in time, I am just fed up with the fact that we have blatant Nazi ideology thriving in a Central European country, supported by the American taxpayer, and the and the American media is ignoring it. But I wasn't uh, making any accusation towards you. I, 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 um, I hope not, because you. I I hope that from the interviews we've done, you know my position that I do not support Nazi ideology in Ukraine. Right. Uh, only difference is I spoke against it all these years all these years because I grew up there. I, I understand very well what happened and how it happened. So nobody can uh, you know, uh, say that in some way, shape or form, I'm trying to protect some poor Ukrainian soldiers. No, 
the truth of the matter is what I'm trying to say is deliver is a, what I hear, what I see, what Cynthia asked me, being a native speaker, what actually is happening, what people are saying. And the, the uh, one of the Ukrainians that I interviewed who actually left Ukraine and lives in Moscow, I actually interviewed several of them, including somebody who is there now, who is a Ukrainian volunteer. And he told me that America is not helping us. America is destroying us. America sending us all this money creates corrupt empires out of our politicians and the, the citizens of Ukraine have no benefit of it. And he said, United States Congress has to stop doing it to us. So yes, when I interview those people who are from Ukraine, um, they pretty much tell me what, what the situation is. And I was trying to relay this to Cynthia. Um, but the, that guy from uh, Ukraine, he said, I asked him, I said, do you think Ukrainian soldiers understand what they're dying for? And his answer was, he said, Elena, they're hostages. So in, in my humanity, I have to acknowledge that there is a portion of Ukrainian people who may be a Russian, who may be a Russian speakers, who are drafted, caught like fish in supermarkets, thrown in the back of the trucks, delivered to the front lines, basically kidnapped, who never want to go fight Russians, who never want to go do that. But it's either jail or murder. They get killed and they get put in jail for refusing to uh, report to duty. So there is a percentage of the people that we have to be fair that, that really don't want a part of it. And they are thrown on the front lines, hunted, kidnapped. And uh, Ukraine has a draft that uh, you cannot opt out of. And the, the uh, military commissariats, apparently, uh, according to some guys, they take bribes. If you don't want to go to the front line, you have to pay a bribe and maybe they'll say that you have a, a malady or a health problem. But majority of the guys get thrown in the meat grinder, whether they like Zelensky or not. And, and uh, it seems like more so they criticize Zelensky and do not want to die for him but they are hostages as well. Not all of them, but there is a portion as well. Going to Cynthia's question about Jewish community. Um, my thought, the Jewish community, unfortunately in the United States uh, seems to be totally disconnected to what the reality is in Ukraine. I don't know if it's uh, by mistake, if it's by ignorance, if it's because a lot of the Jewish community leaders are connected to Democratic Party, and obviously Biden is a Democratic uh, president, because I have attended some functions, and uh, yeah, a lot of the uh, Jewish community leaders uh, do support uh, Biden and Biden's policies. And of course, whatever Biden does to Ukraine goes nowadays, because American people don't even question Biden policies towards Ukraine. Uh, and in Ukraine, um, there are a lot of Jewish organizations that actually seem to support uh, Zelensky. If you have seen the photograph of a Ukrainian commander-in-chief Zaluzhny, together with what they claim uh, a chief rabbi of Ukraine, they're both standing there. I believe that was during Hanukkah or something, and, and they were just sharing, holding either a menorah or some type of an artifact together for, posing for the picture. Little do we know that Zaluzhny, Ukrainian's commander in chief, has a Bandera portrait in his office. Stepan Bandera and took selfies with it. And Stepan Bandera, like uh, Scott uh, rightfully mentioned, was a Ukrainian nationalist who founded the SS division, Galicia division in the Western Ukraine when Hitler occupied Ukraine and slaughtered on behalf of Hitler hundreds of thousands of Jewish people, Russian people, Polish people, gypsy people, Roma people, you name it, ethnic cleansings, that's what they did. But Zaluzhny, chief, uh, um, what is it, commander of Ukrainian troops is posing with a rabbi together for the photo. I'm wondering, rabbi, can you look around and, and, and ask Mr. Zaluzhny, why does he have a Ukrainian nationalist who is infamous for slaughtering Jews, portrait in his office. And of course, we know the slogan, uh, hail Ukraine, hail heroes, or uh, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. 
that was the original slogan from Stepan Bandera and his followers, again, during World War II time, uh, when they embraced Hitler and his ideology. And they killed Ukrainians too, who wouldn't uh, go with their ideology. It, it, these people were insane, but unfortunately, Jewish community, I don't know, maybe uh, is too blinded or tries to be too friendly to the government that um, they simply are engaged and they feel that this is patriotic. And I am in shock that the Jews would support the Nazi ideology followers of Stefan Bendera. That's beyond any comprehension to me personally. Scott? Well, I have to, you know, I'm not Jewish, so I, um, I, I, I don't, I don't have um, that history. But I'm a stu student of history. Uh, what I've seen is the closer people are to the Holocaust, the more they understand how utterly despicable uh, the Zelensky government is, and and nobody forgives a Zelensky uh, because he's a Jew. I mean, uh, but you know, these people they have a term uh, that they they recognize uh, from the history of the Holocaust called a uh, capo. Um, and a capo, of course, is a Jewish uh, person who worked on behalf of uh, the Nazis in the concentration camp to keep organize, uh, to keep the camp organized and to facilitate the mass murder of fellow Jews. Uh, and, and the closer you get to uh, the Holocaust in terms of people, you know, Jewish people, the more they recognize the uh, capo-like features of Zelensky, uh, because he is a Jew working with Nazis to uh, to 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 bring harm to the to the Jewish people, you know. In, in the history leading up to um, the Holocaust, there were many uh, Jewish communities, and you read about this in Poland and elsewhere, where uh, people just said, uh, "Be quiet, let it be. It will pass over. They aren't bothering us right now. Don't do anything." Uh, then they ended up being marched off, slaughtered in the streets, taken to concentration camps, and I think that's the case of many Jewish communities in uh, in Ukraine today. Uh, they know what's going on. They, they see as of. You can't be a Jew living in, in Ukraine and not know what the swastika means. You can't, you, you have to know what the raised arm means. You know, you've seen it before, your ancestors saw it, you know what's happening, but they're falling into the same trap that Jewish communities fell in in, in Central Europe uh, in the lead up to the Holocaust. Um, they're just being quiet, laying low, uh, pretending that uh, somehow they can find a way to exist with the very element that, uh, that can't wait for the time when they can kill all the Jews again. Do they not understand what the basic fundamental underlying ideology of the Azov Battalion is, of what Bandera stands for? They hate Jews. Jews are under humans. They are lesser beings. They are meant to be killed. Um, and this is the future of Ukraine's Jews if uh, Zelensky was to win. Fortunately, Zelensky is not going to win. So the Jewish community will ultimately be safe. And maybe that's what they're hoping for, praying for, is deliverance from Zelensky down the road. But they will not raise their head up because they are afraid of the consequences. And I think that's what we're seeing right now, the total intimidation of the Ukrainian Jewish community. Now, I can't explain why the American Jewish community is being quiet. That I don't understand. That I will never understand. Why does it take a goyim, a non-Jew, to respect Jewish life more than an American Jew? Why do I have to have a better understanding of the realities of the Holocaust and the consequences of the Holocaust than an American Jew? If you're an American Jew listening to this and you're being silent about what's going on in Ukraine, shame on you, shame on you. You need to be speaking up. And don't tell me that it's because you're anti-Putin. Putin is the savior of the Ukrainian Jews, not the one leading them down the path towards a repetition of the Holocaust. If you empower Zelensky, you empower Bandera. If you empower Bandera, you're condemning the Jews to die. That's just a straight up fact. So if you're a member of the American Jewish community and you're silent or you're speaking out against Russia on this issue, you're on the wrong side of history. And it's a darn shame that it takes a non-Jew to tell you this. Elena? I remember, Cynthia, one of our previous interviews, I mentioned that um, in uh, 2014, when on the 2nd of May, the um, people in Odessa, the city of Odessa in Ukraine, were burned alive. I printed the horrific looking photographs of basically charred corpses. And I, I brought this to synagogue and I've shown it to people in the synagogue here locally where I live. 
And I said, this is happening in Ukraine. There is Nazis, there is thugs, they're rising, they're killing people. They just recently overthrew the president in Ukraine. And these Nazis are now murderous thugs, basically, destroying the people of the most famous, very heavily Jewish populated city of Odessa in Ukraine that many ancestors from the people here in the United States from Jewish ancestry came from that area. People looked at me as if I just came from the moon. It was a total disconnect. They, they didn't believe it. They, they thought it's unreal and unheard of that people could be burned alive in a building, rounded up by thugs and prevented from saving their life. People couldn't jump from windows. They were killed on the ground if they made it alive. These Nazi thugs were murdering people alive and burning them just like the Hitler did during World War II. And I was shocked as a very numb, muted reaction at the people of the local synagogue. And they were fine individuals. They were fine people looking at me in disbelief, like this is like not possible. And the main question was to me, why we don't see this on TV? So unless they see this on TV, that obviously has no validation, whatnot. And then, and I said the, uh, the other interview to you is that a few months ago when there was a funeral at, and I attended the funeral of the very notable community member here, a Jewish community member, very, uh, very good contributor to the entire community. Um, the rabbi's wife came to me and she said, oh, Elena, and I haven't seen her since all of this started. And she said, I remember in 2014, you told us about what was happening in Ukraine. Imagine how many years have passed, how many years. So when I spoke about it, I brought the evidence, I showed what happened because it's not on TV and our media is complicit of silencing the truth, not showing the truth. The people in the United States seem to be conditioned to only believe TV. And the media does not uh, show the truth. So the truth must not have existed all these years. And that's heartbreaking. It's very heartbreaking. So uh, final thoughts, Elena? Final thoughts are that uh, it's a uh, tragedy what is happening in Ukraine. It's tragedy that um, American people are still appear to be a bit aloof about this entire uh, tragedy that's unfolding in Ukraine. They seem to have believed that the propaganda and the media that it's all Russia's fault and they do not wish to look at Biden, uh, Hunter Biden, the, uh, the facilities that Newland was talking about, Victoria Newland's role in all of that. The coup of 2014 is not being talked in the media and how come that America and our Victoria Newland proudly got herself involved in uh, uh, destroying legally elected uh, presidency back uh, in 2014 in Ukraine. All of this is very tragic. And until American people will start researching, start finding the truth, until we address the issues with Biden and Hunter Biden and their dealings in Ukraine and how Ukraine has been basically subverted and externally governed, we will not even find out and figure out what's happening to our own country, United States, because they're the same people who are in charge, quote unquote, of both countries. And they lead in both of us uh, down to the path of destruction. That's my thought. Scott, final thoughts? Um, the you know, propaganda in uh, service of a bad cause, um, you know, is... Uh, inconvenient at the moment, but uh, it does not in and of itself uh, provide a pathway towards uh, victory. Um, the American people um, are brain dead. <laughs> the American media is criminally complicit, uh, but the Russian government and the Russian army just doesn't care. They're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to prevail. They're going to win. And at some point in time, we will be confronted with the reality that we were on the wrong side of history. And uh, at that time, uh, we will be compelled to uh, reflect on, you know, how it is we got to where we are. Um, 
why it is we failed is uh, you know collectively and i will hope at that point in time that um we will be able to learn these lessons and um ensure that we don't make those mistakes again but uh sadly history shows us that uh americans learn nothing uh and we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again and um while russia may solve the ukraine problem because of the United States and our behaviors, there will be other problems around the world. And we're just gonna have this lesson repeated over and over again as uh, until which time the American people wake up and do the right thing. Elena, what's on your plate this summer? This summer, Cynthia, oh, a lot. I, I actually do, you know, have a job, <laughs> so I work. <laughs> right. And uh, I am just like Scott, I think I'm writing some books. I'm going to go, uh, down to the beach. I live in Lake Michigan. I have a, what they call a private beach. I hope for some peace and quiet and start um, writing some more pages of the book and uh, catch up with Scott, right? That sounds great. So Scott, what's your plans for this summer? Well, um, in two weeks, I hope to be uh, on an airplane to uh, Russia. Um, where I'll spend 25 days touring uh, Russia as part of a book tour. Um, the, the, the purpose is, of course, to talk about the history, talk about the past, but also talk about the future, how we can repair relations, how we can build bridges between the United States and Russia, um, and hopefully um, create a, um, a body of uh, experience that can be used to defeat the disease of uh, Russophobia. I think one of the big problems we have in the United States the inability of the American people to um, address properly the reality of the issue is that we're blinded by hatred, and that hatred is generated by uh, Russophobia, which is, of course, the uh, fear of Russia, and it's derived from ignorance. So uh, hopefully through this uh, tour, I will be able to um, help overcome that fear by empowering people with knowledge and information about the reality of Russia. And your book, how's that going? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, it, it, it's 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 going okay, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I I don't find out sales figures, but uh, okay. it's been well received everywhere. That uh, anybody who's read it says it's okay. I don't know, Elena. I don't know how you liked it, but hopefully you did. Uh, but um, I loved it. I I think I've uh, you know just shared the compliments and accolades every time that we are together on, on the interviews. Yes, absolutely. It's well, an amazing book. I think we had the long interview about this. I. I told you I commend you for writing. It's basically an incredible history, a masterpiece of the times from the eyewitness. Well, thank you very much. And I look forward to reading your book and, <laughs> um, and, and, and all that. So uh, I think we're all in for a, a productive summer, but it's going to be a, a, a difficult summer because there's a lot of problems out there and uh, citizen activists are... Uh, are needed. And so I appreciate what you're doing, Cynthia. I appreciate what you're doing, Elena, and uh, what everybody else is doing. I think, uh, you know, we might be on the cusp of an awakening uh, within the American public that could lead to some of the meaningful changes that need to occur if we're going to get out of the mess that we're currently in. So after you uh, do your tour in Russia, and it's going to be filmed, right? It's going to be turned into a documentary? Well, I mean, one step at a time. First, I need to go there. Then I need to uh, execute my responsibilities there. And uh, hopefully uh, the plan is to have a film crew uh, help document this and then come back and turn that experience into, um, into, a, into a film, a documentary film that can be shared with the American public. The idea would be to take that movie on tour here in the United States and use that as the, uh, as the vehicle uh, for which to engender a, a broader discussion about U.S.-Russian relations arms control and the need for uh you know changing the dialogue and and will you be doing a book tour that will be documented will it be filmed in the united states as well um it, it could be uh, you know we we have to see well, what you know how we do this first of all making a movie takes time it takes a lot of money um right. you know and so one has to be realistic about resources and uh and, and allocation of those resources. But uh, uh, look, this is a big problem and it requires big solutions and uh, I'm a big thinker. So uh, I think you're onto something, Cynthia, but I don't wanna get ahead of the, uh, ahead of the gun okay. here. Okay, two more minutes, Scott. Give us, an, give us an overview of the book and why people should read it. Well, I mean, as, as Elena said, it's a history book. 
Um, and I appreciate the concept of uh, being a masterful history book, but I'll leave that up to the individual reader. But it's an essential history. Um, it's a history that the average American just doesn't know anything about, but you have to know this history to understand the context of the times we live in, to understand the importance of arms control. Today, when people talk about the freezing of the New Star Treaty, they don't understand why that's such a, a dangerous thing. They don't understand why the, um, the expiration of this treaty um, means the potential end of the world. In order to understand that, you have to go back in time when we had a similar situation in the 1980s. And this book talks about the process of putting in place an arms control agreement that literally saved the world from destroying itself. It's a human story, it tells the story of the inspectors and on the, the Soviets. And that's an important part of the story because these inspectors that went in there like me were cold warriors. And in the process of putting in place this unique arms control um, monitoring facility outside of a Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile factory, 800 miles east of Moscow in the foothills of the Ural Mountains, we got to know the Soviet people. We got to know the Russians, the Tatars, the Udmurts, the Ukrainians, everybody else who lived there. And we learned not only not to fear them, but to be friends with them. So it was a journey of discovery, not only of arms control, but of how the United States and the people of the Soviet Union, who today are the people of the Russian Federation, could work together collaboratively to bring about peace. And um, I say it's a template of hope. Today, we have people who are just very, very concerned about what's going on. And I say, read this book. This book will provide you not only the background information necessarily to empower yourself with knowledge and information, but it's a template of hope. It says we can get out of this if we're just willing to work together. And together means with the Russians, which requires us to build that bridge, to cross over, to talk with them, to invite them into our homes so that we no longer are governed by ignorance-based fear but rather we are empowered with truth, with knowledge, with information that recognizes the absurdity of nuclear weapons and the absolute necessity of peaceful coexistence. And how can they get the book? Uh, you can go to um, scottritterextra.com. That's the preferred method, according to Jeff Norman, my collaborator. Uh, and you can buy the book on that. And if you want an autographed copy of the book, there's a way to get it through that website. Or you can go to the publisher, uh, Clarity Press. It's available on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. And um, my understanding is if you do go to your bookstore and you make enough noise, they'll actually put the book in the bookstore. Thank you. Uh, this has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Scott. And I'm sure there will be other discussions as uh, things evolve. So thank you both of you and thank you everybody for listening and have a great day. Thank you.